Welcome weirdos, my name is Emma Abe and today I will be filming the February wrap up. I'm so excited. Let's get into the books and I probably will be mispronouncing things. That's just part of life here on this channel. I can't help it. Alright, so this month I read 15 books. I'm having such a great reading year this year. Hopefully it stays that good. Alright, the first book I read is Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid. And I read this as part of reading all of the winners of the Goodreads Choice Awards. Daisy Jones and the Six won the Historical Fiction Award. As far as my overall views of this book go, I read this on audiobook. I thought it was fine. I thought it was interesting. I felt a little bit portrayed from what I was expecting. I was expecting to be able to hear their music and the most I got was at the end. There was just an instrumental of their big hit song Honeycomb, which was a little bit disappointing. I was watching all these reviews of other booktubers who were like, oh my god, I really recommend the audiobook because you get to hear the music, blah 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 blah, and that's not really what I got, so that was kind of disappointing. I do think that the audiobook is still good. I think the it's a full cast recording so that's always great and they do a really amazing job. They do a solid bang up job portraying these characters. I was also promised that it was going to be like kind of you don't really know what happened but I felt that the only time there was really ambiguity it was just in little things. It wasn't like there was mass amounts of ambiguity. I don't know, it was just kind of a little bit of a letdown for me although I didn't hate it and wasn't massively disappointed. I just felt like I didn't get what everyone was telling me that it was. I just thought it was okay. I am not a big fan of fan documentaries. In my opinion, it's a lot of the same story over and over, and I don't really find that true interesting unless it's a band that I truly care about. I did really like the descriptions of the music in, in the book. There's lots of trigger warnings in there too. Eating disorders is one of them. Abortion is another one. I'm trying to think. I read this like literally at the beginning of the month. It was okay. I think I'm gonna give it like a four out of five just because I felt disappointed because there was so much hype around this book. I didn't feel like that hype paid off. So based off my feelings I'd give it a three but I do acknowledge that I do think it is better than a three because I do think it was that good. Daisy Jones and the Six does not make me want to read The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. I just, because the, I think the book is going to be very similar in the fact that it's kind of a similar story where you're learning about this starlet and who really did she love and you're investigating kind of her life. And I don't personally find that particularly interesting. So I don't really think I would enjoy it even if it was well written. And I do think that Daisy Jones and the Six is well written. I think that's part of what saved it from a three for me. The most way I feel about Daisy Jones and the Six is just a bunch of empty promises. Next up to bat is a book I read for the booktube prize and I can't really talk about it. I do want to say it was a short audiobook and I read it on audiobook. And that's all I can really say. Wait till April to hear my thoughts. This next one is Chinese Society and Culture by Yao Bao Rong and Wei Zhu. I read this with my eyeballs. This book I posted to my Instagram story reacting to a passage from this book. You need to understand that this is sanctioned by the government. This book is from China. I personally did not get it in China. I picked it up at a used bookstore but it is very obvious that it was published in China and it is extremely clear that this is a book that is a bit of propaganda to sell to foreigners. Keep that in mind that it is sanctioned by the, the Chinese Communist Party. That is also very important to come to mind when you read this. It is the vision of China that the CCP wants to present to the world. The writing in this, it's very clear that it was not written by someone who has English as their first language. There's just little things that are a little awkward and stilted that don't make much sense to someone who is a native English speaker like I am. Overall, I thought it was a very interesting case study in how the CCP wants to present itself to the world and present China to the world. Some of the chapters made me laugh, and not in a good way. 
way. It just kind of felt so opposite of what's going on right now, and keep this in mind, this book was published in like 2007-2008, although I don't doubt that some of the issues that is going on in China right now was still happening then, <laughs> discounting the coronavirus stuff. There's a whole section on minorities. They're treated well and all of this stuff, and that's not exactly true. It just really depends on which minority you are in China. I'm gonna get to this tabby soon, trust me. There's just lots of facts in here, and some of the stuff like was interesting, some of it wasn't. Like there's a whole section on like the geography, blah 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 of China, which is interesting. I just, I was interested in more of the culture aspects and less of the geographic aspects, but maybe that's just because I'm a little bit more familiar with the geography of China. It's also very interesting to see what the CCP is willing to be open about about their flaws. So there's this whole section about women in China and how they were treated and then how they're treated now. And the whole narrative behind that is that, oh, it was so bad for women and then all of the sudden the CCP came in and then all of the problems are solved. They do take a moment to acknowledge that the fact that life for women in China is not perfect. That is very true. There's a huge issue with the whole Me Too movement. It was really interesting that they were fully willing to acknowledge that they have work and progress that they need to do to make women's rights better, but they weren't willing to acknowledge that when it came to other things. And they also dragged the entire world with them because they're just like, China, like everyone else, has a lot of work to do on this front as well. So let's get to this tab. It made me uncomfortable, essentially. I'm going to read it to you. This section comes out of the family planning section, and that in itself is a very interesting section in general. <laughs> There's a wealth of things to talk about just in that chapter alone, but this paragraph really stood out to me, and it is, the requirement on the quality of the newborn mainly manifests itself in promoting eugenics. Premarital physical checkup is urged to prevent those diagnosed with serious hereditary diseases considered medically inappropriate for bearing children from producing offspring. Education and proper guidance are provided for couples of childbearing age to practice eugenics. Not cute. Again, this is where it's important to keep in mind who the writer is, what perspective the writers are coming from, and who the audience is targeted for. Obviously, that is not cool. To most Western audiences, the words eugenics is not a cute look. It's actually gross. I called my mom and I was very upset by this because I'm deeply disturbed by the practice of eugenics and people who say they want to promote eugenics. That being said, I do sort of understand what they're trying to come across. They're trying to say that they want the emphasis on the child that you have, since it's in the section they're talking about the one-child policy, is you want to have the best quality of child you can over the quantity. I just think they made a massive mistake in using the word eugenics. Chinese government, CCP, whatever, if you are watching this, let me know, message me, and I can proofread your books to make sure that they come across as correctly as you intend them to come across so you don't have issues with this again. Because, again, this is portraying an image that the CCP is trying to show as reasoning behind what they're doing, and they're just not doing it in the best way, and I think that's because of a lack of cultural awareness on how the West will interpret those words. When writing in English, they will look up the direct translations, and sometimes the direct translations don't exactly mean the same thing. I ran into that problem all the time when people would talk about pediology. Pediology? I'll put it here, which is the practice of teaching. In America, we don't use that really ever. That's not a word typical in our vocabulary, and I ran into many issues when I was working there where people were writing that word down. I was like, I had to look it up because it didn't make any sense to me. And I think that's a lot of what's happening in that paragraph, but it's just really hard to tell. So I'm very unsure how to rate this because I did find it very intellectually stimulating, but there were times when it made me go, <coughs> a lot of that gut reaction of that Ugh, reaction, I think, came a lot of the not understanding like cultural nuances, so things coming across either wrong or incorrectly, or just things coming off as very hypocritical. Does this book really change many of my opinions about China? 
No, I don't really want to go into that. If you want me to talk more about my specific relationship with China and like how I feel about all of those things, let me know in the comments down below and I can do that. This next book I'm super excited to talk about and that is Gods of the Upper Air, How a Circle of Renegade Anthropologists Reinvented Race, Sex, Gender in the 20th Century by Charles King. I'm gonna tell you right away, this book got a 5 out of 5 for me. I love this book. Keep in mind, I think that's largely because of my bias. I do study anthropology and and I love anthropology, it's one of my favorite things ever. And I think this book is written not necessarily to cater towards me and people like me, but it just hit the correct spot. It really brings to light conversations that anthropologists had been having for decades before things like the civil rights movement was going on or equal rights movements or anything of that sort were happening. They were all happening in anthropologist circles. Anthropologists really did lead the charge in academia specifically it just felt so validating to hear that talked about in the mainstream book that is you know, widely popularized. You can find this in almost every bookstore. I was able to find this in my university's bookstore. I did read this with audiobook and following along. I just really enjoyed it. It just brought me so much joy to read about all of these things we're learning about in classes. If you're wondering about how good it is in terms of telling the history of anthropology and the anthropology of the early 20th 20th century, just know that in some history of anthropology class taught at my university in the anthropology department, this is one of the books that they are required to read. I personally am not taking that class. Essentially, it talks about Franz Boas. He is somewhat problematic in some aspects, but he is just all in general a really one of the fathers uh, of how modern anthropology is practiced. And it was really him and his disciples who included people like Margaret Mead who really reinvented anthropology in the field of anthropology. So let's get to this tab. Context for this, this paragraph that I'm going to read you is really a good way to boil down how anthropology is practiced a lot and how anthropologists can use their field work with other societies and other cultures to help better their own culture, which is a lot of how anthropology is practiced. The context of this quote is that they're talking about the sexual habits of Americans at the time versus Samoans at the time. The solution was not to make Americans into Samoans, of course, but rather to begin to see one's own logic and common sense as only a sampling of one of the many possible ways of shaping the social world, each with consequences that got played out in the lives of real people. It's just a really good way to view how anthropology is approached and viewed because it's really one of the major things in anthropology is cultural relativism and anti-ethnocentrism to not be ethnocentric. Those really are so infused in that statement because you don't want to see your own personal experiences as the one and only true personal experience that anyone can have and everything else is wrong. That's being ethnocentric and that's not really great, at least when it comes to anthropologists and that's a lot of how I live my life. And then there's cultural relativism to see that everything is relative to one's own personal experiences and by default their own culture. Everything is relative and you can't really make statements about whether one culture is better than the other because everything is relative to everyone's own independent culture. Connected with that quote and about really seeing that anthropology is just a way to explore the way we as people interpret our own culture and create our own culture from very similar sets of circumstances or very different sets of circumstances and how there's such a range of what it means to be human and that is beautiful. I just really liked this book so if you're at all interested in anthropology or some different interpretations of anthropology, I'd say really pick this up. It's a really good book. It is written for the everyday person. It is not written specifically for academics or people studying anthropology. It is written for you guys. Please read this. This next book I read is High School by Tegan and Sarah Quinn. They're twins. They're identical twins and they are artists. Do you know how I said in Daisy Jones and the Six that I don't normally like books about bands coming together? This is kind of like this but it doesn't really focus a lot on their band. It really focuses on their relationships as people and then how they grew in to the people that they are today, or at least how high school helped shape them. It really is a really awesome queer story too. Both of these ladies, they are lesbians and they are queer. How they went through their journey of self-discovery, about how they both independently came to the realization that they were lesbians 
and it's just a really cute story. I think I'm also going to give this a 5 out of 5 because I really enjoyed it. I'd never heard of Tegan and Sarah before. They are artists, they are musicians, they put out music. I've looked up their music and I've really liked it. I think what really got me was, I read this with audiobook. In the audiobook, they have recordings of some of the early music that Tegan and Sarah wrote and one of the first songs was Tegan didn't go to school today and just the sheer emotion I felt behind that song and the recording of that song it just really pulled me into the whole story and really changed a lot of things for me when I was reading this book and it's really cool because it is told in both of their sister's perspectives. You get to hear from both of them, which is really awesome. I had a lot of fun reading this book. I hope you guys did too. When I first put this kind of on my list and was kind of like reading it, I was a little bit underestimating it. I wasn't fully into it, but then I actually sat down and read it and I loved it. It was a really interesting view of sibling bonds that I will never experience. I'm not a twin. I have brothers. Tegan and Sarah hated each other in high school. They fought all the time. I love hearing stories of different sibling relationships. So I really like this too. Pick it up. It's fun. The next book is The Silent Patient by... I don't remember who. I don't remember who. I picked this up because it won the thriller category for the Goodreads Choice Award. I think I'm gonna give it a four because it wasn't amazing. I did like it. I was very intrigued the whole time. I do think the reveal is very disappointing. I think it's an interesting concept to play with, but ultimately doesn't really make sense. At least not in my opinion, it didn't really make much sense. I really liked how the story was told. It's essentially not told linearly, so prepare for that. I did not know that. It's really fun to discover. I think I enjoyed the first half of it more than I did the second half, just because I've not written a mystery, so I can't really speak to the whole writing process of a mystery, but you know, if you set something up, you need to have sufficient payoff for that setup. And I don't think that The Silent Patient had that. I still really enjoyed it. I read this with audiobook. The audiobook did have a an interview with the author who said that he was surprised that this is even classified under a thriller and I think that that kind of shows. I don't really think it's too thrillery. I think it was like a good book, well written, um, an ode to the author's roots. The author is Greek and uh, that is an essential part of the book. I've seen some criticisms of it, how they think that it is nonsensical for the for the journals to be written the way they are with dialogue. That really didn't pull me out of the story at all. I've read many books where the journal entries have had full-on sets of dialogue. Maybe it's just a stylistic choice. Maybe that person just was not used to reading things like that or in that style, but to me that did not pull me out of the narrative at all. It was good, it just didn't thrill me. The next book I read is The Titan's Curse by Rick Riordan. This is the third book in the Percy Jackson series. I like it. It was really good. I like the characters and it introduced. He's very tragic. I just feel like I'm gonna say the same thing in my wrap-ups when it comes to the Percy Jackson books is that they're good, they're consistent, and they are fun. I'm not remembering as much as I was in the earlier books, like in the first two books, maybe just because I think it was shortly after this book. I know I definitely read The Labyrinth, but I'm not sure if I read the last one in the series. When I read it originally, like in elementary school, when I got a little bit flabbergasted and got a little bit exhausted because I was just really irritated because the books kept coming out and I would have to keep rereading the entire series and that was really frustrating to me as a reader who is a binge reader and I just wanted to gobble them all at once. With the books coming out and being published, it wasn't working well for me. Better now, because I'm better able to retain some of the information. I did read this with audiobook and no following along, because I don't actually have a copy. Otherwise, it's just enjoyable. I like the whole dimensions of Thalia. I just love getting to explore her character more in this book. It was really fun. It's good. It's good. I don't know what else to say. Is good. Next book I read is Little Women by Lisa May Alcott. This is a reread for me. I did read this when I was young. I love the story of Little Women. Okay, it is a wonderful, cute story. It is adorable. It's made me want to read Little Men, which I have never actually read. I only read this one. There's a reason that Little Women has been adapted so many times. I actually wanted to read this before I saw the movie, the recent movie that came out in 2019, but I didn't because my whole family and 
all my friends, <laughs> they conspired against me <laughs> in the best way possible. Typically, my family and another family that we're extremely close to go see a movie on Christmas. They were just like, oh, let's go see Cats. And I was like, oh, okay, I don't really want to go see Cats. But okay, I guess I'm morbidly curious. They had me fooled. They handed me the tickets and they were like, okay, like go go find the theater, Emma A. I looked at the ticket and it said Little Women and I was like, but we're going to see cats. I'm confused. <laughs> it was the most wonderful surprise to get. I'm so happy that you guys did that. So if any of you guys are watching, no, that was amazing. It made my day and that was wonderful and I love the movie. Anyway, Little Women holds a very special place in my heart. Going back and rereading it, there are some parts that I don't like now. The parts that I don't like about it are very emblematic of its time. It's hard for me to say like why I didn't really like those parts and whether I think it's justified or not for me to not like those parts. I mean my opinion is my opinion. <laughs> I really love this book and I'm not gonna let those little tiny moments hurt the book for me. I just love all the characters. I think Amy gets too much hate. Whoa sorry. It's just so sweet and it's just so quaint and it's so much fun and I can't write cannot wait to read this to my kids one day. Sibling relationships are at the core of this story and I love sibling relationships. I just mean realistic depictions of sibling relationships and I feel like that is perfectly captured. You know, you don't always love each other, you don't always hate each other, but you always support each other. It's so cute and it's just such an encapsulation of childhood and it's a timeless tale and that's why it's told so many times. And I think I'm going to give this a 5 out of 5. The next book is a book I read for the booktube prize and I I can't talk about it because that's what the rules are and it's good. I read it with audiobook. No following along because I didn't actually have a physical copy. Yeah, wait till April. The next book I read is Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs? Big Questions from Tiny Mortals About Death by Caitlin Doty. Oh my god, I'm reading her books in order. So this is the most recent Caitlin Doty book that she's put out and it essentially answers questions that you might have about death and the dying process or what happens to your body. I'm biased. I really love Caitlin Doty. I think I'm going to give this a four out of five just because I kind of wish it was longer. A lot of the stuff that you can get from her other avenues like her channel, other books she's written, or her podcast. The animation so fun and cute that I really enjoyed them and I love her conversational style of writing. It's very much like you get to sit down, listen to one of her YouTube videos. It also doesn't hurt that she also narrates the audiobooks so you get all of her personality that comes in with it and I love it. This is just a really fun book. She doesn't shy away from like talking about like the bigger concepts. She doesn't shy away from talking about science in the books and this obviously is geared towards children being able to understand it and that's kind of a lot of the motivation for writing this book. She just does such a great job balancing that line about being really understandable towards children but also being enjoyable for adults. I really enjoyed this. It's a nice short little book. So glad I finally got to read this. This is the first book of hers that I've ever read. Ninth House by Lee Bardugo is the next book that I read and I read that because it won the Goodreads Choice Awards. It won the category for fantasy I believe. It took me a little bit to get into this book because I had to get you know familiar with the world. I was kind of very confused about what was going on towards the beginning but I stuck with it. I paid attention and I wound up really enjoying it. I thought it was really fun. I don't quite think it's a five out of five for me. I do think it is fun. It's very interesting. I liked it much more than I liked the other books that I read for the Goodreads Choice Awards. I'm very excited for the sequel to come out because apparently there's going to be a sequel. That'll be really exciting. I wish the magic system had a little bit more explanation as to like where exactly like the magic comes from but I think that will be coming in the upcoming books and I loved how central that death was to it if that makes any sense. It was good. I'm gonna give it a four out of five. I'm excited to learn more about the characters. I think the main character is very interesting. It was fun, it was interesting, and honestly I did not know that these temples are based off of secret societies and like Harvard. It was really cool. Again, the audiobook had a interview with the author and the author said that she had a fun time blurring the lines between fact and fiction. I mean I don't know anything about secret societies <laughs> on the Harvard grounds but that was really cool. One thing that I think is a little bit confusing is why they only accept one new member into the particular society once every three years. Wouldn't you want to at least have one new member every year? Because they talk about 
all the time in the book about how magic is like aging out and as you grow older your magic kind of withers like your ability to do magic or access the magic or however that works but at least in this one particular house they only accept it it would make more sense to me if they were having like one new person every year that pulled me out of the story a little bit hopefully that will be explained a little bit more later on the one thing that kind of like confuses me is how much does the everyday world know about the magic in this world because it seems to me that like the general public doesn't really know about it but also some police officers do and writers know how much does the public know are we going to explore that in later books? That'd be really interesting if it was kind of like an end of hero situation where like magic is exposed to the entire world. I don't know. There's lots of questions that I kind of want answers to. <laughs> the next book I read is The Institute by Stephen King and I'm gonna call it. I don't find Stephen King's book scary. I'm sorry. This is about the fourth one I've read and I just don't find it scary. I find them interesting but I'm never scared. Scared? Maybe it's just because what scares me is drawn from really specific things to my life. There has to be very heavily rooted in truth, if that makes any sense. For example, things that keep me up at night, the coronavirus. But not the coronavirus in general, but the fact that we might be under quarantine. That's what I find scary, but what I find particularly really scary and what really freaks me out is running out of food in quarantine. That thought is what keeps me up at night. And scares me. That's it. Nothing else about the virus is scary. Nothing else about quarantine is scary. It's literally the thought of running out of food. I think that's just in general a problem that I would have with all scary books and why I could find books that aren't intended to be scary scary. The Institute, I think it was interesting. It took me a while to understand. They had the whole setup at the beginning that I think honestly could have been cut. Sorry. I think we could have started off with the Little Boy in the first part we did not really need the whole bit with the police officer person. I'm sorry, I don't really see how that was super integral to the plot. I found Little Boy really interesting. I liked learning about the kids while they were at the institute. But did I find it scary at all? No. 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 This is like the least scary that I found of all of the books I've read of Stephen King. I did read this because it won the horror category for Goodreads Choice Awards. A lot of people that I've been seeing on booktube, they talk about the Institute, they say that it really isn't scary. That makes sense to me, it really does. What it really got me thinking about was the radiation ex experiments that happened in Cincinnati. So essentially with these radiation experiments, essentially about 100 people were irradiated and it was sanctioned by the US government and they basically came to these researchers and they were like, hey, we will fund you if you do this and they irradiated 100 people. It's not talked about a lot. I will leave link in the information down below. If you want me to make a separate video about that, I will. It's a whole issue. I just really connected it back to the Institute because these people who are irradiated, some of them were terminal, some of them weren't. They all had cancer. They were all looking for treatments to their cancer, but instead they were irradiated and killed or permanently harmed. They did not give consent. They were not aware that this was going to be done to them. And in the Institute, a similar thing kind of happened and it's very central to like the whole plot. What I kind of found disappointing about the Institute that it doesn't really talk about the ethics of it, it's very clear about how it feels about the ethics of it. Take that whatever way you want, but there is no exploration to the fact that are not even given a choice. To me, that makes all of the difference. Whether the participants have the choice and if and they have an informed choice. In the radiation experiment in Cincinnati, no one was given a choice. In the Institute by Stephen King, no one was given a choice. Both terrible. To me also sad but also a little bit disappointing because that is a very interesting route. Not necessarily that Stephen King had to connect it to these specific experiments that happened in Cincinnati, but just to talk a little bit more about the ethics of the situation that was going on. The next book I read was The Power of Self-Compassion by Dr. Lori J. Cameron. I read this because Audible has a deal going on right now. Well, actually, it's technically over because it's past March 1st. But if you read three audiobooks that were over three hours in like the month of January and February, then you get like a $20 coupon. Books I read for that was Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs, which I wanted to read anyway, The Power of Self-Compassion, and one of the other books I'm going to talk about. I really did not like The Power of Self-Compassion. I was alternating between reading that and the next book that I'm going to talk about. I think it's three 
store. Not that I think that self-compassion and self-love and self-care isn't important. I think it is. It just, I don't do meditation, okay? I just don't. It's not, mm -mm. It's not for me. I get self-reflection. Meditation is not a vehicle, at least in my opinion, for me personally, how I operate for self-compassion or, mm, or reflection or anything like that. Maybe that's because I'm ADHD. I can't, I can't focus on anything and trying to have me sit somewhere and focus on nothing. Oh my god, I could not do that. My brain needs to be firing up all cylinders on all times. I need five different distractions to keep me focused. I just don't do well with meditation or anything like that. And a large part of this book was meditation, guided meditation, all this stuff. And I'm, you are into that, then I'm sure you're gonna love it. But I was not into it. It was like a slog to get me through this. I just kept thinking to myself, okay, if you do 15 minutes, we can take a break and do something else. I, I just couldn't. I just couldn't. Some of the exercises I think might be useful, but I don't really think I'm going to be revisiting the entire audiobook as a whole. Didn't enjoy it, but maybe you will. So I'm going to give it a 3 out of 5 because I realized a large part of the fact that why I didn't enjoy it is because of my own personal interests. But I do see how people could get things out of it. I didn't hate it. I just really recognized that this is just not something for me. Not that self-compassion isn't for me. I just practice self-compassion in a different way than is talked about in the book. The next book is Shanghai Free Taxi Journeys with the Hustlers and Rebels of China by Frank Langfitz. I picked up this book because I saw it in my university's library. That sounds really interesting. I wonder what it's about and it was really different than what I thought it was going to be. I thought it was just going to kind of be about what it was like to drive around like this free taxi and the implements and going into creating this free taxi. I thought it was kind of like a free taxi service with multiple taxis, but no, it was this journalist going to China and trying to talk candidly with the people of China, and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a really honest look into the mindsets of different Chinese people, and it is there is a really good discussion in there about what kind of state would you want to live under? Would you want to be living under what is currently America, or what is currently China. I thought some of the criticisms for both were very fair and some of the benefits for both were really fair and I really enjoyed that particular portion. I found it really enjoyable. I really liked it. I love books more of like this, just a little bit more journalistic in nature and doesn't glorify China but also doesn't condemn it the entire way. It, it shows a really realistic picture of China, again from a foreigner's point of view. I really enjoyed it. I think I'm also going to give that book 5 out of 5. I want to get it and I would recommend it to you guys who want to learn more about China through an NPR way. I believe that the author was a reporter for like NPR or something, NPR or something like that. I don't really remember exactly, and I was really sad for it ended. I was like, I could listen to like 30 plus hours of this. Yeah, 5 out of 5. It was really good. So many really great discussions. The next book and the last book I read officially in February is From Here to Eternity, Traveling the World to Find the Good Death by Caitlin Doty. This is the second book of hers that I've read. I read this as the third book in order to get that coupon on Audible. And this also was something that I was looking to read anyways, and I also really loved it. Caitlin Dowdy also narrates the audiobook, and I read this with audiobook and following along, and I think she does a really clever thing in the beginning is, because the whole premise of this is that you're learning about death rituals and grieving rituals from all over the world, and she starts off in where most people read, who are reading this book and who most of her audience in America. And I think it was really awesome because I think a lot of Americans tend to think that our funerary customs and our grief rituals are the standard practice all over the world. And it was really cool to see an alternative to that and I really enjoyed it. I enjoy all of her content when it comes to death rituals and grieving rituals because she makes a really good point about how death and grieving is treated in American society and how she doesn't like that. She is extremely open about how she does not like that. She wants to help change it. That is a large part of the vision and the thought behind her funeral home, all the activism she does, the books she writes, the channel, and the podcast she has. She, she talks all the time about other funeral home directors who hate her because she wants to like uproot the entire system. That's part of what makes her really attractive for me. Not to get too personal, but I, grief and death, is something that is very triggering for me. I don't 
handle it very well. And I view that as a large part of how American culture has enculturated me to feel about death and how I should grieve. And the way I experience grief is not how I want to. And the culture in America in general about how we view grief doesn't help when it's come to my own conversations about my own mortality and how I deal with grief and talking to other people who I care about about this sort of things. Caitlin Doty has been a very great conduit for those conversations to happen and help me realize that this isn't how it has to be for me personally. I don't have to keep experiencing death this way. I don't have to keep going through grief this way. That is a really good message for me to hear because I know the way it is right now doesn't have to stay. And obviously her books and the media she puts out is not a replacement for therapy. <laughs> I am getting therapy to, to help. It's comforting to know that there is a light at the end of this seemingly unending tunnel. That's essentially all I want to say on this matter. This book was really good. I think I'm going to give it a 4 out of 5 because I wanted it to be longer. She talks about the sky burials and I wanted an entire chapter on the sky burials and there wasn't. <laughs> it's still in there. The way she talks about the sky burials is just amazing and I love the way she talks about the sky burials and I just wanted more. That is it for this book video. Thank you for watching. <laughs> Leave any comments like down below if you have questions. Ask me what are your opinions about these books. Are you going to pick up some of these books? Let all of that stuff. Let me know all that stuff down in the comments below. I'm fine for the most part. I'll be okay one day hopefully. <sighs> I did not expect talking about that to be so draw out what it did in me. Do all the things that you're supposed to do as a viewer. Like, comment, subscribe, share. I don't know. Yeah, bye. Are you recording? Ha! What is the next book? What is the next book?